So why this interest in, in multi-species crops? And what is wrong with the way that crops are, are, are grown now? Which is the obvious question we need to ask. Now, we've grown crops as monocultures, as single species crops for a long, long time. And usually with, with a, a, a lot of ground disturbance and, and now moving into more and more uh, pesticides being used in, in, in growing crops. Um, we know that we can grow very high yielding crops with the methods we're using now. So what's the advantage of, of, uh, of cover? And obviously I'm going to answer uh, or, or address the reasons or some of the problems associated with um, uh, industrial agriculture and the way crops are grown now. So if, um, so certainly in Australia, but also around the world, and Australia is definitely not unique in, with problems in agriculture. I get to many countries now, and Australia actually is not going too bad. Um, we've got, a, I think, a better environmental conscience than, than certainly the Americans have got, um, and, and many other countries as well. So um, the way crops are grow, growing now, it, it it really, there's only one way to put it, it really have stuffed our soils all over the planet um, and, and reduced soil carbon levels is one of the, the obvious things that happens in relation to that, which the outcome of that is ineffective rainfall or people that are that irrigating the need for, for more irrigation water. Also, the problem with soil fertility, meaning or problems in soil fertility decline more fertiliser is required, increasing insect attack, more insecticides, increasing crop disease, more fungicides. So that's the, a, a big problem with uh, the way agriculture is being practised now. Um, and multi-species crops can go a long way towards addressing many of those things there. Um, another thing that is a serious problem with the way we grow crops uh, and, and if we look at that slide, there's 10 tonne of soil loss for every one tonne of grain produced around the world. Now, we can't keep doing that for, we, we've, been, we've doing, been doing it that way for a long time now, but how long can you continue to lose, lose soils? So, why and how did, did, did that, this destructive form of agriculture happen? Now, I'm just gonna go through this little section. I, I presented this in the last couple of, of workshops I did. Um, and I don't know if some of you may have been on, on one or more of those those talks, but I will address this again because it is an important thing to, to get our heads around. Um, and after the Second World War, there were genuine concerns about, about being able to grow enough food for the increasing world populations. And, and, and that was in the early 1950s. And interestingly, we're talking about the same thing now. But around that time, a new agricultural revolution was developed to solve those problems. And it was labelled the Green Revolution. Um, and it developed high, new high-yielding crops and, and fertiliser and pesticides to help crops yield to their maximum. Now, there's a lot of criticism of that form of agriculture and, and it's justified now, but at the time, that form of agriculture did address the problems they were trying to solve. It, it did produce more food. Uh, it did address a, a lot of the, the um, uh, hunger problems in the world and pe pe people starving, starving and, and of that sort of type of thing. And, and so it worked to a degree. So it was very successful. Um, and the, uh, one other thing is that created wealth for farmers, which is, is often overlooked. Um, I grew up on the tail end of, of, of this, uh, this, this form of agriculture. My father adopted um, a lot of the Green Revolution stuff, a lot of fertilisers, didn't use, fortunately, didn't use a, a lot of pesticides in, in those times. And this was up to the late 1970s. He was doing that. But certainly uh, introduced 
high yielding crops and, and got really into monoculture crops and, uh, and, and a lot of fertilizers. Now, and that, as I said earlier, that form of agriculture did create wealth for farmers. It, it actually was very successful. It does sound like, like an ideal method of agriculture. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it actually has created many problems. It, it's been a disaster and it's, it's been a, an ecological disaster um, for our farms and the planet. Now, and there, those problems are related to, to declining soil health, which I mentioned earlier, dependency on fertiliser, dependency on pesticides, reduction in food quality, which is, is rarely ever addressed, and human health problems. Now, the problem with it, where at one time the, the wealth was with farmers, now it's with multinational companies. And this, this graph, which is actually a Canadian graph, and it is available uh, um, on the internet, you can, you can find this graph there. And, um, but as you can see from that, it goes from 1926 to 2016. And everything, like farmers were going okay from, from the 1940s to, 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 the, to the late 19, well, mid 1970s. Um, agribusiness was, making, was always making, making profit, but farmers were going okay as well. From about the 1980s, uh, everything started to, to go wrong. The wheels started to fall off and farmers start, were going broke. And remember, this is in Canada, but the Australian graph, I've been working on uh, getting a, a graph done exactly the same way for Australia. Um, and so when we look at uh, 1980s, farmers were actually going broke. And, and, in a serious way, while agribusiness was was making billions of dollars, that illustrates very simply what's wrong with agriculture. Um, the agri agribusiness are just simply in it to make money. That they, they have no conscience at all. They are not interested in in, in uh, farmers doing well, just making money for themselves. That form of agriculture has to change. We can't continue with that form of agriculture. We can't afford it anyway. It was interesting. I spoke um, last uh, February. I was in, in the US and I presented this graph to, to the Americans and they were quite shocked by it because Canadian graph, it was just only over the fence and uh, it, it really hit home hard to them uh, uh, in a couple of uh, conferences I spoke at over there. So, in other words, many of the things we do in agriculture make someone else wealthy, not farmers. Us farmers seem to get the wrong end of the pineapple every time. Um, and uh, it, we, it, we need to change that. And it, it's up to us to change it. We, we can change it. We don't need to, to, to be locked into, into that form of agriculture. So also, that method of agriculture is creating serious human health problems. And Agriculture really is supposed to be about food, but there's something really wrong when we look at the quality of food. And, and the, these figures sometimes put out, I use them a bit, but other people as well. I've just condensed them, but you can go into this in more detail. And mineral depletion of vegetables, uh, meat and dairy, from 1940 to 19, not, 1991, only 1991, very difficult to get these figures up to now. And I, I think there's an obvious reason for that. I, I think there's, there's bits of cover up going on with this. But these are actually, most of these figures come from England, some from Australia, but, but uh, there's no American uh, figures on it that I've found. Um, so, and if we look at mineral depletion as, uh, or mineral in food, have declined by 60 to 90% um, in all, all food. That, that we that we eat and um, it is possible today to buy an orange without any vitamin C in it at all. So that's half the reason why we, we all need to take, take vitamin tablets now. So I'll just move on from that. So, but, but just to, or to sum that up, most of the decline in nutrients is related to a serious decline in soil health and soil carbon. It is really that simple. So if our soils are, are 
and don't have the nutrients in them, how can, how, how can we possibly get nutrients in food? In other words, poor quality food is caused by poor quality soil. Uh, all those problems that I, I, I mentioned a while ago they are in that little, little talk a little bit there, increasing fertiliser and pesticide won't fix those problems. The farm ecosystem is the problem. The farm ecosystem is stuffed. And that's about the only way I could, I could describe it other than some better adjectives than that one. Um, no one ever puts um, ecology and agriculture in the same sentence, but virtually all of our problems in agriculture are, are, are actually ecological problems, not agricultural ones. And we always try to fix them in, in an agricultural sense, but they're actually ecological problems. So in other words, Mother Nature can fix them for, for, for us. And it, we can fix it really quite easily and gr by growing plants. Grow plants, plants and more plants um, will fix those problems. But how do we do this? And really all we need to do is allow the farm and soil to function as an ecosystem. As, our soil is actually an ecosystem, it's a functioning ecosystem, but our farms should function as ecosystems as well. If, they if both soils and farms, fa our farms function as ecosystems, um, we, we then do start to have more diverse pastures, grasslands and crops, and better nutrient cycling, um, which means less fertiliser, then no insect attack, uh, no insecticide, no plant disease, no fungicide, and less animal disease. Now, all that adds up to more profit. And you think, well, that, how, that's impossible. But I guess it, I hope if we go through this, the, uh, this talk, well, as well as the, the one in the future, we'll understand how that happens. And basically, it's, if we allow Mother Nature to drive it for us, we can fix those problems. And it is relatively simple. So, one of the things that gets gets uh, banded about a bit, I'm going to address many things uh, today. Uh, one, one of them is, is uh, nutrients and fertiliser. The other, other ones is, is how we may be able to address insect attack, how we may be able to address uh, plant disease, crop disease, many things we're go going to look at. So the question that get, gets asked all the time is where do plant nutrients come from? And do we have to use heaps of fertiliser? Um, and if we think about natural systems, there, there wasn't there wasn't people running around with bags of fertiliser a thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. But, and if we look at the planet and where nutrients come from, uh, this planet of ours is over four billion years old, four and a half billion years old. All the nutrients that plants and animals are used were on the planet and are still on the planet. They haven't gone anywhere. Um, bacteria and fungi use enzymes and acids, or they, they did in that process of the evolution of this planet. Bacteria and fungi use enzymes and acids to break down rock and access minerals. Over time, plants evolved and created the cycle of, of, of life, death and decay and built soil. Without plants, we would never have had soil on, the, on this planet. Plants are really the drivers of everything. Plants and their association with soil microbes. Yet, you know, I'll just, before I move on, yet we're told all the time that we have to put heaps of, heaps of fertiliser on to, 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 uh, for, for this to work. And we're, we've been told a whole heap of nonsense and lies for a long time and almost um, instilled fear in us if we don't keep fertilising the pro property or putting pesticides on, the wheels were going to fall off and, and Armageddon was going to happen. Well, no, it doesn't. Um, but there are methods and, well, there, there are ways of transitioning from what we're doing now into uh, a different form of agriculture. And certainly multi-species crops are, are, can be a part of that. So how do plants make soil nutrients available? Now, soil is a living, breathing, subaquatic ecosystem. Now, I love this little microscopic <laughs> colour on here. It's microscopic, it's amazing. Uh, it, 
commonly called a water bear. There's water bear. There's obviously a scientific name for him, but I, I, I'm not sure what that is. But this is basically just to illustrate that our soil is alive. And there's in, in a small spoonful of soil, there, there is over 6 billion, with a B, billion microorganisms in a spoonful of healthy soil. So our soil is alive. No idea who counted the 6 billion microorganisms, but someone did. And uh, that's a very, very important thing to, to remember. So, and, and also, these, all, all of us saw microorganisms need food. How do we feed them? Um, it's part of the problem in conventional agriculture, conventional high input industrial agriculture, very few of these little guys get fed because, well, to start with, pesticides and, and uh, really aggressive ploughing uh, kill them anyway. So everything we've done in agriculture has, has been to the detriment of, of uh, our soil microbes. So just moving on from, from that, soil microbes require plants for food. That's where they get their, their food from. And they get their food from plants, uh, from, from root exudates or sugars that ex get exuded into the soil. With photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis with, with uh, sunlight, uh, uh, carbon dioxide and water, uh, make simple sugars uh, through photosynthesis. Plants, plants make simple sugars. Um, now, when plants uh, make those simple sugars, only about half of them uh, go into to actually producing leaves. The other half, it's actually about 40%. As, as, is pumped into the soil uh, as sugars around around the rhizosphere or the, the roots of the plants, uh, and that feeds soil microbes. Now, if a plant is giving away almost half of half of the energy it's producing, it's obviously doing it for a very very good reason. That's feeding soil microbes, and uh, microbes. Uh, live off some microbes, not all. Some microbes live live off the sugars that these these plants are pumping into the so into the soil. Um, now, also uh, microbes live off dead and decaying material um, like plant litter uh, as as well. Now, in return for especially for for the plant root exudates or sugars, in return microbes supply nutrients to the plant. And I've got another slide to illustrate that a, a bit. A bit more. Now, deep plant roots uh, also cycle nutrients and make make nutrients available to plants. So, in other words, plants, if we let if we allow them to grow bigger, put down a bigger root system and then cycle nutrients round and round. While I'm on plant roots, or sorry, plants generally, um, we get told all the time if a plant is growing there, it's, it, it's using nutrients and we need to put fertiliser on it. How many times have we been told that? Now, if a plant is growing there, what it's actually doing is cycling nutrients. It's, it, it's, act, it's, it's all those nutrients are just simply going around and around. Now, if we remove that plant, if we cut high off it or, or we remove the whole plant, take it away, then we've removed nutrients. But most of the time we manage well, plants aren't removing or they're removing very few nutrients um, and and actually cycling nutrients and doing a really good job. But implied that that, that plants are, are detrimental to soils it couldn't be for any more wrong. Uh, plants are absolutely essential for our soils. So, living growing plants are the drivers of soil health, soil structure, and nutrient cycling. So. Um, Mycorrhizae, you might, you've probably, many of you have probably heard of mycorrhizal fungi and, and Dr. Christine Jones talks a lot about mycorrhizae. Um, but in exchange for root exudates or these sugars I was just talking about, mycorrhizae in particular uh, 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 use that, that, uh, those sugars and in exchange for that supply nutrients to the plant. They supply phosphorus, nitrogen, trace elements and also water to the plant. So very important, important symbiotic relationship. That's been going on for millions of years uh, uh, with, with plants, with mycorrhizae. 
protozoa are nematodes, eat bacteria and fungi, which supply nitrogen and other, other nutrients. And also free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria supply nitrogen, and that can be up to 40 kilos per hectare of nitrogen. Now, don't get me wrong here uh, in, in, in saying this, and, and don't, don't go out in the paddocks this afternoon and just totally eliminate fertiliser. We need to be a bit careful how we, how we do this. Um, this is not about not using uh, fertiliser and it's not about not, not using anything really, but be a bit more careful about how we do it. There's some, just some work, uh, Tim Wiley, Tim Wiley used to work for the West Australian Department of Ag. Um, Tim, uh, he did a lot of really good work in, in Western Australia. Now, he was always interested in plants and he, he measured, uh, in that West, West Australian sand, it's a perfect place to, 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 to do this, um, bare soil and then uh, underneath a perennial plant uh, and, and, and the difference. So he measured bare soil just alongside of a plant and underneath it. Found the carbon levels had increased underneath the plant by, by over 400%. Um, phosphorus increased by over 300%, potassium over 300% and sulphur almost 300%, and also a big change in, 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 uh, uh, in, in soil pH. So the only thing that was creating that change was the plant itself. And it, it, what it was doing, cycling nutrients, um, increasing carbon, and, and just driving the whole process. So it's a really interesting, very uh, like a, a small little, little like, experiment that, that Tim did, which was very valuable at the time. And, and he's now. Tim did that quite a few years ago. So how do we restore our farms? By growing a diverse range of plants, plants and more plants. This can be done in a few, few different ways. Now, just, uh, uh, we'll just look down the bo bottom of there, there. We can do it with multi-species annual uh, cover crops. And just working up from the bottom, I probably should have had it around the other way. Uh, perennial cover crops, which are pasture cropping, obviously I'm going to speak a lot more about both of those today. And, and grasslands or perennial grasslands or, or perennial pastures. Um, our farms, we really, longer term, we need to move them towards perennial pastures. Or in saying that, I'm, I'm not going to talk about grasslands and pastures today. Um, but we really need to think seriously about uh, having more perennials, perennial grasses and plants and, and, and great diversity of pastures on our properties. So what is cover cropping? The forerunner of cover cropping was, actually, was, was green manuring. Some of you may have heard about green manuring. It's a practice used well over 100 years ago, 200 years ago, by growing a legume crop. Mostly, mostly they were using legumes and often they'd use peas. Um, before the main, main crop. In those days, they'd grow, grow a, a, like a, a pea or any form of legume, and this was done in Europe, obviously, um, and then they'd plough that, that, that legume crop into the soil. It, it worked extremely well, um, it, and this was before fertilisers. The only fertiliser they had was, was manure, um, like uh, cow manure, horse manure. Um, and... But that, that was a, a very successful crop and, 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 or method and worked very well for a long time. Um, when fertiliser was developed, like chemical fertiliser, which happened from the, actually in the 1920s on, that form of agriculture was stopped. It, it became too easy to go and buy a bag of fertiliser and, and, and use it. But the adoption of cover cropping now, which is relatively new, um, really used, I guess, some of those broad principles that were used 100 years ago, of growing, growing a, 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 a crop. In those days, they were only mostly growing a single species, crop like peas or, or whatever. Um, but, but it's been moved on from, from that. And, and, but the broad, broad principles are very similar. So... Cover cropping itself can be described as sowing an annual crop uh, between periods of regular crop product production. The main purpose to create thick mulch into which 
following cash crop is planted using zero till methods. But really, it's a biological soil primer, and, and that's important to, to, to remember. Now, um, cover cropping was tried in Australia, um, what is it now, uh, 15 years ago? Uh, it, and what was happening then was, uh, it was done around central, central New South Wales here, around where, where I am, um, and it was only very marginally successful. It, it, it wasn't that successful and it wasn't adopted. And what, what people was, were doing then was sowing crops like cereal rye <coughs> or um, just a single species, or a uh, cereal crop, mulching that on the soil surface and then painting crops into it. Um, there were problems associated with that and a lot of them was, was uh, nitrogen drawdown problems and, 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 and it, it created the thick litter on the, litter on the soil, but it didn't re address many of the other problems. And, uh, and, and so it wasn't that, that successful. So, and, and the reason why it wasn't successful is, is that it was only one species. It was only one type of plant, which was a cereal. This is a lot more than just creating lit, uh, thick mulch on the soil surface. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the point now, uh, uh, the fact that I've got this biological soil primer there is vitally important. So, cover cropping can be either annual cover cropping or perennial cover cropping. Pasture cropping, that with this, what I de developed in 1993, myself and Daryl Clough, uh, is actually perennial cover cropping. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in this talk, but I'm not going to talk a lot about, about pasture cropping. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about multi-species crops. Now, the difference in the two, um, cover cropping itself uses an annual crop to create mulch, control weeds and improve soil health. Pasture cropping, instead of using an annual crop, to, to do that, pasture cropping uses perennial grass to create mulch control weeds and improve soil health. That's the broad difference in it. One's a perennial system, the other one's an annual, annual system. Now, multi-species crops can be used for cover crops and or grazing crops. And there's no limit on how many species you can use. Um, six to 10 species, I use often six to eight species in some of the mixes here. Um, and it, and it does depend on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and that's the important thing. What, what, what we're trying to achieve is, is, is very important because we can tailor the mixes or the species in that mix to fix particular problems you may have on your individual farms. Um, now, uh, also grazing crops, I'm going to talk a fair bit about, about grazing, growing grazing crops. Um, one of the things that these multi-species crops are very, very high quality grazing crops. So multi-species crops address many problems. Um, whereas when I was talking a while ago about the single species uh, uh, cover crop, multi-species crops do address many, many of the problems and, and address the, the problems associated with the single species uh, cover crop. Now, it is important to include cereals, brassicas, and legumes in the mix. Um, and anything else you can think of. There's, no, there's really no rules in, in this, whatever works on your property. Um, so, why grow a multi-species crop? So, as I mentioned before, many people are uh, uh, are adopting multi-species crops, and I'm, I'm very surprised. It's the fastest adoption of, of any that I've seen. Uh, since I started talking about uh, multi-species crops about, when was it, five or, five or six years ago, um, I'd, I'd actually been using, uh, I started multi-species crops about 10 years ago in, in, um, uh, and moved it into those. But anyway, uh, the adoption of multi-species crops has been fairly quick and a lot of the reason why people adopt 
multi species crops is uh, is, is the, the better stock feed. It is extremely good stock feed and faster weight gains and, and growth rates and, and, and far better help, uh, uh, stock health on them. But there's a lot of other reasons we do, we really need to, to be looking at. If, if <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with growing it for stock feed, but if we aren't aware of some of the other benefits, we miss a lot of the advantages of, of growing a multi-species crop. Certainly, we can prevent soil erosion and with, with them, and that's because a lot of the lead up time where we usually plant a crop, uh, like in, in conventional agriculture, uh, the soils are bare. They're either bare from plowing or bare from, from, from uh, uh, herbicide applications. Um, but what we're doing in, in leading up to that is putting a, putting a multi species crop in, which so we're covering our soil. <clears throat> These multi species mixes can and do improve soil structure. Uh, which improves water holding capacity. Nutrient scavenging uh, also means less fertiliser. Uh, weed control, which less herbicide, uh, control pests and diseases, less pesticides. We can put legumes in there, which gives it uh, more, more, more nitrogen uh, uh, or, and reduces fertilisers. <clears throat> um, it can increase carbon levels and does increase carbon levels. Uh, we can certainly drive our, our soil carbon uh, by using uh, these mixes. Um, and we can prepare the soil or paddock for, for a following crop, which is, which is what most of the Americans um, and, and, and other countries are, are using uh, the, the, the covers uh, for a following crop. Not so much here in Australia. So, and all that adds up to more profit. Um, I'm going to talk about, about cost with this uh, as, as we move into this as well. So, using different plants to fix problems. Soil structure is one of the, the, the most common or soil structure problems and soil structure decline is one of the most serious problems that we have. And I, I see it in all countries. And this um, also in, in Australia, in almost every property you go on to, I go on to, there's, there's, some, there's some soil structure problems and some serious soil structure problems on some properties. Now, mostly what we, we, we do to fix soil structure is get out and plough it. Unfortunately, ploughing is, 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 has been what's caused the soil structure problems in the first place. So, it definitely will not fix soil structure by ploughing it. I mean, I'm talking about displowing. Um, the other option is also is deep ripping with, with something like a yeoman's plough, uh, which, which can work, um, and, and, and some people do that. It's an expensive exercise for the machinery and also pulling this thing through the soil. But if we use plants like radish, turnips, sunflowers for summer, summer forages. They're actually uh, biological subsoilers, especially uh, uh, radish and turnip. Um, and they will break through plough pans and aerate poor structured soil. And they are a really good thing to include in these mixes. And we can tailor make uh, mixes specifically for soil structure, fixing soil structure problems. Now, as we improve soil structure, we improve water infiltration, but we will never increase soil carbon while ever we've got poor structured soil. It's one of the first things we need to fix. And poor structured soil is, is, is one of the reasons why uh, we don't get nutrient cycling. So uh, it, it, it is important. That's why I've got that one of the first things up there. Um, but fixing them with plants is a better way to go and cheaper as well. <clears throat> we can get weed control with multi-species uh, multi crops. Um, now, we can employ, in, in, include plants like uh, forage brassica and cereal rye. Now, some plants, and they, they are mostly the brassicas, um, exude uh, chemicals that, that are in, inhibit uh, weed growth. And that's allelopathy or, or allelopathic effect. Um, and 
weeds can be controlled by shading and competition also, and creating ground cover with plants and litter will control weeds. Now, in relation to ground cover, <coughs> this one's fairly obvious, and I'm not sure why it isn't adopted in agriculture more widely. Um, now, we've known for, I don't know, probably hundreds of years in gardens, vegetable gardens, all sorts of gardens, that litter and mulch on gardens will control weeds. Now, we put mulch on gardens, um, and we all know the reason why, to control weeds. Uh, uh, also, to, so we don't have to wear it so often. In other words, it conserves moisture. It also um, controls or, or, or um, uh, modifies so, uh, soil temperature. Uh, it keeps, uh, keeps our so soil uh, cooler in the summer and warmer in, in the winter. Um, so ground cover is extremely important and we can, can use, use crops uh, for that and uh, to increase our ground cover. <clears throat> in regard to the uh, uh, chemical exudates, the photo that I've got up there uh, was, a, was a, a really early days when I started experimenting with, with uh, different mixes. And that was a really simple mix. I was just trialling different stuff and I had a few different plots and paddocks. And I, all I had in there was oats and, um, uh, and, and uh, forage brassica. That particular one was one called Winfred, which is a common one. It's a cross between kale and turnip. Very good stock feed, but it's, it's a forage brassica. Now, I had some different plots I, had, I, I was trialling. I had 50 kilos of oats, and in those plots I had, I put um, everything from one kilo per hectare uh, two kilos per hectare, and then four kilos per hectare. That particular paddock there had four kilos per hectare of that forage brassica, and the weed control in it worked that well that it actually killed the oats. So don't sow them at four kilos per hectare. Um, so it, it, and it actually, the oats didn't do any good in there at all because the, the, the effect of the brassica just took that oats out and every, anything else wanted to grow in there. Uh, the other ones where I had, had, had uh, two kilos back there was fine. Uh, so it's just an example of <laughs> what you can do wrong, but also um, that we can use these uh, the, some of these plants for, for weed control. Okay, we can also use uh, uh, different plants for for making nutrients available. Um, including deep-rooted plants like turnips um, or, or radish, that, this, that, that's uh, tillage radish, uh, or daikon radish is what they actually are, but tillage radishes um, in a mix will cycle nutrients from deep in the soil profiler. Especially radishes have a very deep, they've, they've got a big bulb on them uh, and, and <coughs> um, um, and, and but they've got a, a, a big root system underneath there as well. So they're they're actually uh, uh, bringing nutrients up from depth. The bulb on on a turnip and a radish is actually a nutrient storage vessel. If you think about it in this way, okay, a great as, as a vegetable, but it's also storing nutrients, and those nutrients have been cycled from deeper in the soil profile, stored in that in that bulb. And if we're a bit careful about, about this, if we let those, those uh, um, the bulbs, uh, the, the, the turnip and, and the radish bulbs break down, just, just rot down, then they release nutrients back into the soil, which can be, be, be used by a following crop or, or just are used for pasture follow, following. Uh, so uh, we, it's, it, we can use, use uh, different species for cycling nutrients. <coughs> This is just some information. We, we often think of things like cereals as, as detrimental. This is some, some uh, bit of data from the United States Department of Ag um, with just cereal rye. Now, these crops were grown and, and then terminated. Uh, cereal rye crop, like uh, they weren't grazed, they were just grown, uh, left green and, and then terminated. And knowing the Americans, they probably sprayed it with Roundup. Um, <laughs> but the so in other words, it was let grow and then killed. 
nutrients, and then they measured uh, the the the, uh, the nutrients that 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 uh, seroriaxy cycles and made available. And it's really interesting. Uh, everything from 28 inches high to, to uh, sorry, 12 inches high to 28 inches high, and when we get down to the uh, 28 inches high, there's a lot of just if, if you read across there, like a lot of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, all of them, potassium, many things, but just been made available. Now, that wouldn't have been available at all if that was cut for hay and removed, but because it was just recycled, uh, it was, uh, uh, so it's just an illustration of, of all plants will cycle nutrients, really, as, as, as well as those uh, uh, turnips and, and radish, if, if we manage them well. Not uh, we shouldn't be growing a a a, 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 a cover crop or a, 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 as a single species, but um, that was just some research work. Some other stuff here. This is a good friend of mine. This big fellow here, David Brandt. Uh, he'd be he would be I I would think, in my opinion, anyway, probably the best farmer in the world. How he lives in Iowa. Real character he is. Um, uh, and and uh, Dave has been doing some really good stuff. He's, he's basically the father of, of, of zero tillage and cover crops in, in the US. And, um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of research work has been, has been done on his property. And that's just from, from those radishes. And you can look at the amount of nutrients that, that this is pounds per acre, but that's very close to, to kilos per hectare, pounds per acre. The nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, all that there, huge amount of, of, of uh, available of nutrients being made available with that with those radish. Um, just shows what what plants can actually do for us if we if we manage them well. Um, also, uh, soil health and soil carbon, a mix of species provide root exudates, which I mentioned before. Uh, sugars being pumped into the soil for and, and for organisms and, and and essential for ma maintaining healthy soil, increasing and increasing soil carbon. If you look at the paddocks that even on your own properties, but uh, look at, at some of the the continuous cropping blokes that are using either especially uh, tillage and ploughing and, and a lot of uh, herbicides now or pesticides. Sorry, those soils are really not only bare but but compacted, um, poor soil structure, and there's nothing happening in those soils. You're never going to increase carbon in, in, in an agricultural system like that industrial model. And, and it's been shown. Um, a lot of the early, not information, I guess, um, I guess criticism coming from scientists, and, and they kept saying, you probably would have heard it, that you can't increase carbon in soil. And they're exactly right. You'll never increase carbon in soil if you keep using industrial agriculture. They were right. You've got to do it better than that. Um, and and some of the, these, what we're talking about with these multi-species uh, mixes, certainly can do that. Insect control. Um, now, what we can do with, it, with insects, so I'll tell you a little story here in a minute when I, when I, I finish this, but... Uh, is um, add flowering uh, plants to these mixes. And, and they can be just, well, we know that, that um, most many things will flower. Like the, the radish and turnip will, will flower. Peas are a good thing to put in there as, as a flowering plant. Vetch, annual vetch, good thing to put in there. Anything that flowers will, will or can attract beneficial insects. Um, um, and, and then those beneficial insects will then control the the, the crop damaging or pasture damaging insect. Yeah, something that I noticed this year, or uh, we harvest a lot of native grass seed here, and almost every, every well, up until this year, when we're harvesting uh, uh, native grass seed from our grasslands here, the um, I, I reckon we we collect more spiders than we do seed half the time. The 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 seed is just uh, crawling with spiders, all sorts of spiders, strange coloured ones, all sorts of things. What I was fascinated with this year, because we'd just gone through this, this uh, huge drought basically for three years, and then we got good rain and these grasslands just exploded out, out, 
and, and, and end up three feet high, we're harvesting seed in them, there was no spiders. And what was happening, we, I think, was, um, uh, was that the spiders hadn't had time to breed up, but there was all sorts of grubs and, and all, all sorts of other insects in there, no spiders. Now, as we've been pro progressing, we, we got rain and then so we held, held up for, for a bit longer and then a week later, harvesting another paddock, there was all these uh, lady beetles in this paddock, still no spiders, but the lady beetles had, had moved in and they were feasting on all these other insects. Now, as, as, uh, thing, as, as time has gone on, now we're starting to see spiders in there. So it, it's really is interesting um, uh, how Mother Nature starts to fix things for us. So we can do that type of thing. We can start to add, add flowering paints to some of these mixes, which will then drive. It's all about that getting things functioning better. So this is just some example of here, uh, just using a bit of data collected here uh, on the property here. Um, the insect counts here have increased by 600% on the property here compared to the neighbouring property. Uh, and insect diversity has increased by 125%. And we no longer have insect attacking crops and pastures. And that's because the spiders are, are, man, are controlling the insects. Um, so disease control, in balanced soil ecosystems are uh, uh, disease controlled by, by natural enemies. Uh, a d diversity of some microbes interrupt, will interrupt and control many fungal and bacterial just crop, crop diseases. This is some information or data collected here again, showing uh, increase in, in uh, fungi, uh, bacteria, protozoa and nematodes, um, again, compared to neighboring property. Um, um, and, and that's the reason why we don't get crop diseases here anymore. Uh, it, it's it's about not an, uh, it's about it, about um, microbial or soil microbial diversity, which is driven by uh, plant diversity. So, um, with most multi species crops, as I mentioned before. Uh, we can and do get better uh, or improved grazing and better better diet. There's no doubt about that. It's one of the first things that I I saw um, in, in regard. We're running sheep mostly here. Um, the, the animals were healthier. Um, they were healthier in that they didn't scour on on the crops. Like you put 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 the um, a mob of sheep or cattle. Cattle are the best example. On on a, a just a crop of oats. Nothing wrong wrong with oats. At all, but but on a crop of oats, cattle, <laughs> uh, cattle or sheep, but they'll go around the fence and eat every weed on around the fence. We've seen that happen, and and, and then they they finally start eating the oat crop, and then you end up with cow shit from one end of the paddock to the other. They the feed goes straight through them. What happened? Uh, what I found really interesting was with a multi-species crop, they they don't scour that the feed doesn't go straight through them, and that's because they've got a better diet. Um, so while ever uh, they've got a better diet, they get faster fattening, faster growth rates, and, 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 uh, and actually more feed. Now, it, uh, it is interesting, we're involved in a MLA slash land care project this year and, and to, to, to measure the health of, of, of animals. Um, crops have been sown multi-species crop compared to a single species crop and we're going to graze them with uh, merino uh, weaners and uh, it, it split two mobs and then weigh these animals and just record how they go on them uh, see if we can get some good data on that. Uh, also far less metabolic disease uh, in, in, in multi-species crop when compared to single species forage crop like oats or or, or, um, uh, uh, or anything like barley or any of those single species crop or a, a single species uh, brassica crop as well. So how can we increase ground cover and increase soil, soil nitrogen in plants? Just working through the things we can do with, with, with different plants. Um, now this takes a little bit of getting our head, getting our head around. 
um, but I'm, I, I will try to address it. Growing different plants will produce different carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil. Um, and in saying that, I, we can, by, by growing a different uh, a mix of plants, soil nitrogen can be increased and or soil organic matter can be increased with different combinations of plants. Now, um, I, and I'm going to explain what, what a, uh, this carbon to nitrogen ratio means. Using high carbon to ratio crops of the 30 to 1 or greater, we, uh, we can increase soil organic matter. Having multi-species crop, crop with an ideal carbon, carbon nitrogen ratio can supply nitrogen and other nutrients and, and or maintain ground colour. Right, now, a mix of oats, forest brassica, vetch and pea will produce a crop with a, with, with a carbon nitrogen ratio of 26 to 1 for high quality forage. Now, if we compare that to a, a mix of species that contains a higher percentage of cereal rye, um, cereal rye, cereal rye is used for this because it, it has a high, it's high lignin content. Um, so, if we use a high percentage of cereal rye and less leafy plants like brassica, it will have a higher carbon nitrogen ratio of 35 to 1 and produce more organic matter and ground cover. Um, now, in other words, we can use, um, I don't know whether my pointer works on this, we can use uh, plants uh, with, with, uh, with higher percentage to produce ground cover. And we know, we know this, 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 this works. If we grow a, um, if we have wheat stubble on, on, on the ground, it, it, it gives us good ground cover, uh, but it mostly sits there and doesn't break down. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a clover paddock, it breaks down really quickly and you don't have anything left at all. So that's sort of what we're talking about here. It's, it takes a bit of getting your head around this stuff. Um, but it's all about either more organic matter or less organic matter. Um, an ideal uh, diet for microbes is actually 24 to one. Microbes can break down 24 to one. And remember that they're, that that crop there has has a mix of that is 26 to 1, which is pretty pretty close to an ideal soil microbial diet. Um, this one here, 35 to 1, is really not good bacterial food. It uh, it takes decomposer fungi to break that down. Okay, <clears throat> cereal rye um, is is like I said, is really high lignin, 80 odd to 1. Oats draw not as much. Now, if we look at vetch, is 11 to 1, forage brassica, 12 to 1, clover, 21, uh, uh, daikon radish, 19. So those, in other words, those leafy green things, they, they have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. The other side of that is we can use those leafy plants to, to actually increase our soil nitrogen uh, for, for a following crop or, or to improve our soil, soil nitrogen. Um, I hope that hasn't confused you too much. Now, selecting multi-species uh, crops, uh, this, is, um, this is just a mix, uh, sorry, not a mix, but, but uh, groups of, of plants that we can use. Any of the, the uh, and, and we can, we can put, Mostly, mostly what I do is just use either one of these on their own, like oats. Oats is a, is a, is a really good plant to use in, in multi-species mixes. Um, this year I've used barley because I had some in the silo with this really dry season. Um, so any of those can be used uh, as the basic base for, for, for um, uh, some of these crops. We've got a few, quite a few legumes we can, we can choose, um, field peas, uh, vetch, lupins, clover, lentils, you know, all of those uh, are fine. There's quite a few black brassicas we can use. Forage brassicas, there's quite a lot of those are available now. Radish, turnip, or sweet, kale. Well, kale's not used very much. It's, it's too expensive anyway. Ryegrass, I mean, this year with the price of oat or any of these cereals, especially oats, some of those fast-growing ryegrasses could be used 
instead of, of the cereal, uh, if, if it adds up uh, uh, cost-wise. For example, oat now, especially up this way where I am, is close to $2,000 a tonne, um, which is ridiculous. Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to justify buying oats at $2,000 a tonne, but, but some of these other ryegrasses and that. Um, but there's other ways of doing this as well. Um, and I've got, got some prices here in a minute, uh, which, I, which I probably should talk about it then. So, <clears throat> multi-species crops, um, like, as I said, any of, the, any of those cereals can be used as a basis, uh, uh, for, depending on the cost uh, of, of a mix. Uh, annual vetch is really good. Um, doesn't do as well, I found, on, on, on granite soils. It, it, some of the red country it does well on. Um, it doesn't do as well here as something like a, a field pea. Um, but it is very good stock feed. It can fix heaps of nitrogen. And interestingly, it cycles phosphorus. It makes phosphorus available and provides good habitat for beneficial insects. So it's a really good good one to have in there. Like, and, and it has to be a soft seeded annual veg, um, not not the hard seeded variety. Field peas, excellent stock feed, and and good nitrogen, good for, for fixing nitrogen. Now, one of the things, uh, one of the problems with field peas is that it doesn't recover very well from grazing. One graze and it's just about, about finished, but it is it is very good stock feed and it's about having uh, species diversity in there. So it doesn't recover, whereas the annual vetch will recover uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and you'll get more, more than one grazing of it. <clears throat> Forage brassica, um, now, very good feed. There's no doubt forage brassica, I, I, high protein, very highly digestible feed. Uh, turnip and, and, and the forage brassicas, which I've been talking about, uh, Winfred is one that I've used now for quite a while, but there's quite a few of these uh, um, forage brassica crosses uh, that, that can be used. The um, tillage radish or daikon radish, a tillage radish that gets promoted all the time, and uh, it is actually a daikon radish. It's an Asian vegetable, been around for thousand years or more. Um, so, so it's not a new plant. It's just been pulled out of the garden and used used for its soil health benefits. Um, turnips can also be used. Um, they probably don't go as deep as as a radish, but usually they're a lot cheaper to buy seed turnip seed and. Because they're very small seed, they, they are, um, are generally fairly cost effective um, and can be, mainly because they can be used at half a kilo per hectare is, is quite a lot of turnip to, to put in, in a mix. I'm going to give you some of these mixes later too, um, uh, just what, the ones that I use and for different things. So how do costs compare with single species crop? Uh, the overall cost certainly can be can be more expensive, uh, but we're showing the, the rates of these mixes that between um, 25 and 50 percent less than what we normally would. Uh, you certainly reduce the rate; it's more like 25 percent or, or, or even less. Um, I tend to keep the cereal side of it higher, and then then adjust the other smaller seeds. These are prices uh, this year, and they, they are they are dearer. Uh, however, like oats, oats is, is extremely expensive. So how, how do we get around that one this year? Forest brassica have, hasn't changed a lot. It's, it was always around ten dollars a kilo, um, and and you use it at one to two kilos per hectare. Um, so that that's the cost there. Um, tillage radish again one to two kilos per hectare. It, it's it's a uh, Eight dollars a kilo annual veg is two dollars a kilo. This is prices that I got in uh, February this year, so uh, they'd be fairly close. Um, now veg because it's a bigger seed needs to be sown uh, thicker, five to ten kilos per hectare. Um, rarely do I sow it at ten kilos. 
field peak also um, it, it uh, is a big seed, so it needs to be sold at a higher rate. Um, and 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 then turnip. I've actually put uh, favour beans in. Any you can get hold of uh, uh, in in some mixes if you can. Uh, favour beans not good stock feed, but they're a really good plant to put in there for the, especially the soil health benefits. Are, and it's a big deep rooted plant as well. So these are mixed, uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you the, these. I can also email some of these mixes to, to Dean, and he can send them out to you. Um, that's just a, that's a, a mix that I've used here a lot. Uh, but this is pretty well the mix I use most years. Uh, oats at 40 kilos per hectare, field pea 8, vetch 8, forage brassica 2, uh, radish 2, and a turnip half a kilo. Um, and uh, that that's very good stock feed, but it's pretty good for for soil health benefits as well. Okay, we got any? any uh, I might just move through, and and we'll have some questions at the end. But think about your questions on on that. Oh, hang on, it is lunch. It, it is lunchtime on that. Um, right. Have we got any any questions? We have got a quarter of an hour. Can you tell? Tell everybody what so a little bit about your farm and your enterprise and how you managed to sort of take this path. Because that's an interesting story that I think provides a context for your talk. Yeah, well, yes, and I, I didn't include it in this because there was a lot of stuff to to get get through. The um, I I grew up in that industrial or that green revolution stuff or the tail end of that. My father adopted. Um, and, but we were starting to see decline in the, in the property in the 1970s and the advice at the time was to put more fertiliser on. Um, and, but we had a fire in 1979, a major fire, like very similar to these ones we've just experienced now. And we lost all, most of, of three quarters of our sheep. We lost 3,000 sheep were killed in it. Um, so there was 1,000 survived uh, uh, in that, but... Uh, all the buildings were, were, were burnt, a house and shed were burnt, were burnt. Most of the fencing was gone. It, it, there was virtually nothing left on the place. It was like an atomic bomb went off. Um, so how do, I, how do you survive that? And it's probably an interesting uh, uh, a story for some of these people that are trying to survive now from the fires. Um, the thousand years that survived, it was really quite interesting. The um, uh, they were, they were, many, many of them were, were burnt also, but many of them had no ears left. The, the ears were burnt off them and, and, and burnt up the insides of the legs. But we kept all, all, all of those, all, the, all of the, the ewes, and, and double lamb them uh, twice a year and build our numbers up from, from those, uh, those ewes. And we kept them on here uh, until they actually died of old age, surprising how long a ewe will breed for. Um, and they were 12 years old uh, and still having lambs. Had no teeth left, um, but we let them die on the property. We, we, we uh, thought, gee, if they, if they pulled us out, out, out of uh, trouble like that, they, they had the, the right to die on the property of old age without, and, not, and not sell them. So that's what, what we did. And, and so we built our numbers up by just double lambing, autumn, autumn and spring. Um, I... Uh, I started to grow crops uh, then as well, like, and I started to grow, grow crops uh, uh, by ploughing and that in, in early 1980s. That, that crashed on me uh, fairly quickly. And, um, uh, so then I adopted uh, direct drilling or zero tilling, probably about 85, 985 or something like that. <clears throat> and, and I started to run into problems with that, crop disease and the standard stuff and weeds and all those problems crop diseases and um, and uh, so I went and got some agronomic advice and the advice at the time was to double the fertiliser, some advice being given today, um, more herbicides, um, more herbicides in crop, all that stuff and it was interesting, the fertiliser recommendations was, was uh, that high that 
the not and the nitrogen in that fertilizer was that high it was toxic to, to wheat plants so the only way we could address that was to double shoot it in other words put some of the fertilizer down deeper um, and exactly what's recommended today and, th and this advice was in the um, late 80s and so I so in other words the fertilizer was, was was that high it was toxic to, to the plants I was sowing so I didn't accept that advice and I started to, uh, 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 well, the reason why I didn't accept it was we're going to kill the wheat plants, but also it's ending broke with many more money. So it was around that time I, I developed pasture cropping in conjunction with Daryl Clough, and we were direct drilling, and uh, but using heaps of, of Roundup to kill our native grasses here, uh, as well as weeds. And we reasoned that... Uh, those native grasses were going dormant in the winter, those summer grasses going dormant in the winter. And um, so there was no real need to kill them. Um, they were going to sleep for the winter. They weren't going to affect the, the crop. So that's, and so then we, we both tried that and it worked really well. Um, so that's how I, I, I changed. Uh, I stopped using uh, uh, superphosphate in 19, uh, 1979 was the last time it was, was put on. Hasn't been any uh, superphosphate put on this probably for, for 40 years. Um, and all of our soil tests, uh, everything gets better, not worse. Our soils improve, all of our nutrients have improved on the property um, by an average of 170% uh, and, and without fertilisers. We do put some fertiliser underneath the crops, but that's been reduced by 70%. Um, then I've started to use some, some biological type products as well. Um, so that's really uh, how all this happened. Uh, I had no one to advise me on it. I was just, I had to use, I, I started to use, uh, look at low input agriculture, but it had to be more than low input for me. We had no money at all. We are broke after that fire. Um, and so it had to be no input agriculture, which is where, where a lot of the stuff I'm talking about has actually come from. It came from necessity. Uh, of not having the money to, to, to spend on, on all those inputs, fertilisers and pesticides. Okay. Um, any any uh, questions on that particular stuff? I just... Okay. A good legume that, to, that in granite soils that cycles phosphorus um, is actually, uh, well, vetch and pea are always, always good uh, for that, but don't think of one species uh, in, in when we looking at this we, if we can get five six seven or ten species in there they'll all be complementary um, uh, and so it's important to think about more diversity you won't put too many in it I can assure you um, uh, but there's, there's quite a few like you um, even lupins lupins is not good stock feed but it's really good it does cycle phosphorus and, and it does go grow well on, on, on granite soils Okay, uh, one here about about uh, importance of using untreated seed in your mix. Um, not talking about inoculated, inoculated seed. I'm talking about the seed treatment, like yep, no, nicotinoids. Um, this guy's be, be behind other less sounder names. Like yeah, it's great. Aha, uh -huh. as a beekeeper, well, yeah, that is a very good question. <clears throat> um, Yes, it is difficult to get uh, to get untreated seed. Uh, the um, neonicotinoids, which is mentioned there, is actually been associated in the US in particular with colony bee collapse. Um, and, and, and absolutely correct, the gaucho and a lot of those those, those things have uh, uh, and promoted as you need this stuff, it's, which is a bloody great heap of garbage. We don't need that stuff. Um, now. One of the problems we've got is uh, is sourcing seed that that um, uh, that doesn't have uh, those uh, um, uh, those need nicotinoids or insect controls or all that sort of stuff on it. Uh, you can order them now. Someone that has started his own seed business is a fellow called Grant Sims. Now Grant is uh, uh, near Shepparton somewhere. 
Uh, Grant is, is selling seed mixes, so it's always good to, to contact Grant. Uh, Grant. Um, I could send you his contact details uh, if you like. But there's one, and, and um, people that are a bit entrepreneurial, there there is potential for people to set up their own uh, business. These multi-species mixes are going to become more and more popular. An example of that, in the US, um, two brothers, a farmers, um, um, Burns brothers started green cover, green cover crop seeds, yeah. and um, uh, they just started as farmers uh, selling mixes, and it developed into a multi-million dollar business for them. Um, they can't produce enough seed, so that there's potential for that in Australia. Now Grant seems as, as sort of got in pretty early, which is really good. Um, so that's just something for you to think about, but. Part of the reason why is is that these other companies are selling uh, seeds with with um, uh, chemicals on them, inoculated seeds. Uh, um, so uh, try to get them without those on them. Uh, as we should never use a, a seed with fungicide on it. For example, we try to we try to increase uh, soil fungi, and yet we we've got fungicides on our seeds. Um, so. Try and move away from that, uh, if at all possible. Um, uh, okay, here's another question here. I was really curious about uh, being able to substitute some deeper rooted species for deep ripping. Could there, there still be an argument for deep ripping first, so to speed up the process? Uh, there can be, yes, there, there can be, but if you're going to deep rip, and I, I am going to address this later, if you're going to deep rip, put some seed in while you're deep ripping. Uh, and you can use, you can put in some of these mixes when while you're deep ripping. Because if you're rip, ripping on sodic soils or soils, granite soils often have a sodic clay layer under them, uh, they'll heal back over uh, within 12 months, which defeats the purpose of ripping. But if you can get some plants growing in that drip, in that rip line, that will kickstart things and, and, and keep that rip line more, more open. And I, I am going to talk about that um, uh, later. A good multi-species mix for dairy goats, good point. Um, one thing we need to be careful about, and I don't actually know, but we do know that some plants do taint milk. Uh, so we need to be careful with um, making sure that they don't. Uh, um, just have to check on that. Um, uh, and I, but I don't know. I don't know. It may, possibly some of the brassicas might, but that's something that, that you would need to check on. Otherwise, um, in the, any of those forage mixes uh, would be really good, uh, but tainting milk could be a problem, with that, but I'm not sure on that one. Um, yeah. You ever cut the cover crop for barling was left on the ground and another cover crop planted the following year. It's preferable, absolutely preferable, not to bale it. Um, you are defeating the purpose of, of, of growing the cover if you're removing all that material. Um, something that I say uh, uh, to people, like removing, removing hay and, and cutting hay and removing it, okay, uh, no, I'm not saying don't don't do it because you're trying to address uh, a, a problem, but it is it is one of the worst things we can do because we are removing all the nutrients when we remove hay. The way around that is buy your hay off your neighbour and and let him stuff his soil. I mean, <laughs> really, it's a it's a better way of doing it uh, uh, rather that that. And, Ideally, we should be leaving that material on the soil um, um, because you you are going to not only remove nutrients, but it will be uh, uh, detrimental to soil structure as well. How have you overcome issues with red-legged earth mite from Sue, from Sue um, attacking legumes and germination early stage of growth? Um, that was certainly one of the things that, one of the problems we had years ago, 
we were always having problems with red-legged earth mite. was our, one of our major insects. And I'm, when I'm sorry, this was 30, 40 years ago. Um, but since I've changed uh, and adopted a lot of the stuff, well, mostly pasture cropping and changed the grazing management um, and now have good insect diversity, we don't get insect attack at all in, in the crops. Um, and, and that's because we have a great diversity of insects. Uh, uh, so that, that's the main reason. Uh, we need to be careful in the transition because you certainly can get insect attack. Just because you start doing things differently doesn't mean to say Mother Nature knows about it yet. Um, so just be careful with earth, earth mite and, and things like that, early days. Um, I just made a decision one day not to use any, any uh, um, insecticide, and that was 25 years ago. Um, and uh, I just decided not to use any more, and I haven't since. So um, you can do it, but it is a bit of a leap of faith and you worry about crop damage and stuff like that. Uh, but it will happen, uh, especially now we know how, how to drive that change and insect diversity better. Um, that were the main... That were the main um... Well, can I just jump in with the one point of observation? Yep. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. I guess the, the risk is for a lot of people and, you know, including myself and so on, is that when you try something new that's different and without having a realistic expectation of what might happen, um, if it fails, it's too easy to say, tried that, didn't work, gave up, went back to what I was doing. It's, uh, it's, that's a great comment, Dean. Um, and when we do anything, like the transition stage, and I, I spend a lot of my time with, uh, advising people how, how, how they can transition. It's one of the most difficult things, but we should always transition from what we're doing to something different gradually and very carefully. Don't go broke while you're, try, while you're transitioning. So, in other words, do it, do it on a... On a, 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 on, a small paddock at a time, see how you go. Um, and uh, um, I guess uh, for the, it, my sense of getting burnt out was an advantage, really. I guess I had no choice. I had to change. Uh, I mean, it's a really hard, hard way to learn. But, um, uh, the, uh, but yeah, you need, need to be careful and, and transition slowly. And that includes... Uh, weaning off anything and, and any uh, pesticides, herbicides, uh, fertilisers, just do it carefully um, and over time. Um, what I did with fertiliser here, like cropping, well, I went cold turkey on, on the pasture fertiliser, but the cropping fertiliser, I just wound it back. And we were using 80 or 90 kilos per hectare at one time and then Every every year, I just took it back ten kilos a, a hectare, and then just checked. It. I did some trial strips every time, and then found we weren't, and then got it back to thirty and forty kilos and less. And then now there's no no difference if it, it, higher rates or lower rates. It's 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 pretty well the same. But I did it over 25, 30 years. Um, but now we can speed that up. Uh, and these these multi-species uh, crops can be part of the uh, helping to transition. We're going to move on to sowing <coughs> multi-species crops um, and just more specifics on, on what we, we, we can uh, do. And, and um, so now traditional methods of sowing crops with ploughing and tillage can be used, but I really don't recommend it. I mean, Ploughing is a big part of our problem. Ploughing ploughed soils, poor, poor, poorly structured soil uh, associated with ploughing. So if possible, transition to zero till. Now, okay, if you've got no equipment and it's the only thing you're using, that, that doesn't mean to say you still can't grow multi-species crops. Growing multi-species crops, even with, with ploughing and, and tillage, will definitely be better than, than, than sowing a, a, a single species. So um, don't not do it because you haven't got the equipment or don't want to go, go zero till. 
uh, you still do it, but think about how you may be able to get off, off uh, or away from, from uh, uh, excessive ploughing. Um, and the reason why um, ploughing is so destructive um, and excessive soil disturbance destroys the soil ecosystem to start with, soil structure, soil microbes and carbon. And if you think about it this way, if there's a building uh, full of people and someone ran a great big steel blade through the middle of that and turned the whole building upside down, would not do the people in that building much good at all. Now, ploughing does exactly the same type of thing to soil microbes, turns everything upside down. So if you think about it that way, every time you attempt to get the dish plough out, and I'm talking mostly about dish ploughing here, and I, uh, not so much uh, a, a deep ripping. I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. Soil moisture is something that comes up, especially with the cropping cropping blokes. And, and I, when I read through the comments there, uh, Dean uh, mentioned that most of the people on here are, uh, are graziers, um, not so much interested in, in the cropping side of it. So this is a, even less of a problem in that sense. Um, but this is, again, stuff from the United States Department of Ag. Uh, the work happened in the US a bit quicker than here. Uh, and the main reason why, we, we had a real pushback in this country from many of our soil scientists, and many, many of our, so certainly from our agronomists, but certainly some of our soil scientists, which were anti any of this, like for the want of a better, better word, regenerative ag agriculture, there was even a pushback about, about uh, soil carbon. So that was part of the problem. On the other hand, the uh, American Department of Ag we got really interested in soil. It was a big driver. And then they started promoting um, uh, cover crops and multi-species crops. So anyway, so multi-species covers or cover crop or crops can increase, actually increase soil moisture. The opposite to what you think. And they do that over time, uh, and it, and most of these things are over time. It doesn't happen overnight. By it, we can increase soil carbon. There's no doubt about, about that with with, uh, with with by growing plants. When we increase soil carbon, we increase the water holding capacity of soil. So we increase the sponge effect of, of soil. Um, also, we can increase water infiltration uh, by, with with many of the, these plants or this, the plant mixes which improves soil structure, we improve soil structure, we will improve water infiltration and soil carbon. So, and crop residues or, or, or ground cover litter reduces evaporation and the overall soil ecosystem is improved uh, when we start to do this. So there's a lot of really good reasons. Like some, we, we get told, have been told for a long, long time now that, um, we need to get rid of every weed before we grow a crop because it, they, they'll take soil moisture. Well, um, not if we do it right. Um, it, yeah, we, uh, we, we don't necessarily have to lose soil moisture uh, with, with these, these, these methods. Weeds, I'm gonna talk a bit about weeds uh, now. Most of our farms are now, or many of our farms, are now dominated by, by annual weeds. It's the way, way it, it, it has, has gone. I'll just, now, if you look at this uh, here, and I'll just go back and that again. If we look at that arrow, um, plant succession from bare ground to forest or, or scrub is, is along that line. Now, interestingly, the most of the, our properties here are, are now are, are around this area, around annual weeds and sometimes some colonising perennial species. Um, now, and, and that's related to bare ground, mostly bare ground. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. What is fascinating, this diverse grassland up here is where we should be. Interestingly, uh, our Australian Aboriginal people managed for diverse grassland for 50,000 years. Um, so, I mean, who are the clever ones? That they, they, they actually managed for, for grassland, not for forest, uh, and not, uh, but more for, for grasslands. And there's a couple of interesting books. Um, Will Gamage's book, uh, the, um, the Biggest Estate on Earth, is a really interesting one to have a look at in regard to a lot of that. Uh, and, and Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, also addresses a lot of that as well. 
Um, okay. Now, if we think of weeds, weeds, most weeds are just annual plants. Now, when I'm talking about, about weeds here, I'm talking about annual weeds, not not the perennial weeds. Like perennial weeds are, are, are potentially a serious problem and we need to, to approach them more seriously for that reason. But annual weeds um, are, are just, are really are nature's healers and they heal, heal the soil by covering bare ground. Um, many of our weeds also have tap roots on them. Uh, most are colonising species that take advantage of bare soil. Uh, many weeds also like high nitrate soil and we can control by managing high nitrate soil levels. And um, we, need, we need to, best, best weeds are best controlled by creating ground colour. Now, if we think about how we farm, I've grown crops now for a long time, we create bare ground. So we're actually creating the perfect conditions for weeds to, to colonise our, our, uh, our, our cropping country. Um, that's exactly what weeds are, are for. That they they have evolved to um, to uh, to take advantage of bare soil, and they they really do uh, heal our soils for us. So we need to look at weeds a, a little bit differently. But if we know why they're there, we can we can and can uh, solve our problems quite easily. The plants we use in cover crops and multi-species crops are are annual plants that behave. Just like weeds. In other words, nothing new in in, in the in these uh, multi-species crops. Um, Mother Nature developed them a long time ago, and we're using them for exactly the same reasons that weeds grow. Um, it's just that these multi-species crops uh, we can actually make some money out of. Fairly difficult to make money out of weeds, but <laughs> so all we're really doing is planting weeds that we can make money out of. Now, some people don't like hearing that, but that's. <laughs> That's really, if you think about it, um, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. So, in control, controlling weeds, I mentioned this before, but uh, fast-growing plants, quick canopy, which is quick canopy closure, maintain good ground cover, and we can use herbicide for, for weed control in relation to sowing the crop. Remember, this section's on actually getting your crop into the ground, the multi species crop. Now, um, I also mentioned this before, weeds can be controlled by shading competition um, and, and, and ground cover. So pre-sowing, if weeds are not going to affect the growth of the cover crop or, or the multi-species crop, they may not qu require controlling and, and can, come be car can, be, can become part of the, of, the, of the cover crop mix or the multi-species mix. Okay, most of the time, if you try to grow uh, things into actively growing weeds, it will, will, all, it will be very disappointing. Um, so we need to have a look at, at how we can do this. Um, now, weed control with herbicide may be necessary if weeds are, are not are going to affect crop establishment and growth. Now, there are some other ways I'm going to address uh, later on how we can do this without herbicide as well. Um, so just a few ways of, do, do, uh, of, of doing this. Now, in regard to herbicides, and this is more, more related to pasture cropping, um, one of the problems with the way we grow crops is, is, is Roundup itself. Now, all of the human health problems aside at the moment, um, Roundup just works too well and kills every bloody thing. And that's one of the problems with it. We don't want to kill, don't, it shouldn't need to kill every, everything. If we use more selective herbicide, we, we can do this far more effectively. Leave the things you want in there um, and just control the ones that are going to affect the crop we're trying to establish. Um, now, Now, in crop weed control, this is an interesting one. Uh, because we're growing a, mi a mix of species, um, we could have eight or ten species in them from, from uh, cereal crops to broadleaves to everything else, there isn't an option for in-crop weed control, which I think is great. It keeps everyone off the boom spray. Um, 
So there, there really is an opportunity. If, you, if there isn't a herbicide developed yet, that, that won't kill something in that mix. Um, so, and, and uh, like I said a while ago, I think that's an advantage, really. Some weed control, however, is possible with fast-growing cannabis clo closure um, and, and, and uh, also the effect of alleliopathic properties from, from some plants. Um, and they do work quite well. Like the weeds don't usually affect the crops for that much. And not only that, if it's for grazing, if there's a few weeds in there, it doesn't matter. If you don't tell your cows that they're weeds, they don't know and they'll eat them anyway. So don't worry too much about weeds in the crop. In fact, those weeds in the crop crop are actually can are, are, are part of that the the uh, uh, multi species mix really just a bit more diversity in there. It, and if if they 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 re okay stock feed, there's not a problem with them. Remember the, the just. I always remember the reason why why you, you're growing these crops. So, seed drills. Most zero-till seeders can be can be used. Um, now, zero tillage. I just got a definition of zero tillage in here because I I, re I realised over time not everyone really understands what zero tillage is. The actual definition of zero tillage is defined as a system of planting sowing crops into untilled soil, so there's no there's no ploughing at all, um, by opening a narrow slot or trench of sufficient width and depth to obtain proper seed coverage. Um, no other soil tillage such as ploughing and cultivating is done. That's the, the, the definition of, of, of zero tilling or direct drilling. Um, just a bit on, on, on machinery here. Um, a few different types of, of points on them. Um, you do need a, a with a, a time direct drill machine. You need a time with really strong time. Uh, sorry, a machine with really strong times, and the points on them need to be um, uh, are suitable for direct drilling. Like uh, certainly conventional. Uh, points are, are, are not suitable, and the main the the, the main ones that are used are knife points and inverted T points, uh, get chisel points, and a few different things. There's plenty of information on this. This technology has been around for at least thirty years. I use knife points here, uh, which are seem to be fine on the granite soils. Oh, that's right. I was asked a question a while ago on what soil type we have. I have here, and it's granite soil. Um, and, um, a not overly fertile soil, granite, uh, uh, granite soil, fairly coarse grain granite. Disc seeders, they certainly can be used as well. Um, they, and disc seeders are good. Um, the only problem, uh, or the main problem with them, there's two problems with them. If you have soil compaction issues, like poor structured soil, disc seeders will usually get a disappointing result because they don't create any loose soil under under the seed, so the, the soil is, seed is sitting on on hard soil because they don't penetrate very deeply. The other problem with them is they are very expensive. Nothing to pay hundred thousand dollars for a disc seed seeder. Um, so, uh, in saying that, if your soil's in good condition, uh, like good structured soil, disc seeders do work extremely well. And most of the cropping fellows now have moved towards disc, disc seeders that have started with zero, zero tillage. <clears throat> so seed drills don't have to be expensive or complicated. And, and this is going to address a question that was asked uh, in, in the questions. Uh, and many people convert their existing machinery uh, for pasture cropping, but also uh, for, for uh, well, even just normal, normal cropping. So I've got a series of photos here of different machines. That's a machine that I, I converted here, that, 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 the one I used, the only one I used. What it is, is an old international scarifier. It was lying around behind the shed with two flat tyres and I, I looked at it and I thought, gee, maybe I could resurrect that thing. And so what I did with it was tighten up the springs on it, open them out wider, open them out to, to foot spacing, 30 centimetre spacings, put knife points on it, 
um, and, and put an air cart behind it. Um, some people put uh, uh, seed boxes on them. Um, I, I kept adding to this thing, uh, can't help myself. I, I put disc openers on it and I put uh, liquid injection on it for, for um, uh, compost teas and, and worm leach, all that stuff. Um, so, the, but that is basically an international scarifier. And then there's heaps of them lying around the countryside. This is a very common conversion. It's a, a, a neighbour of mine is an organic producer, Rob Lennon, um, uh, and um, he converted an international scarifier, and, and the, um, they convert very easily. Um, anyone want to convert a, a, uh, an international, especially in Victoria, um, Alan John's machinery uh, make conversions, very good conversions, to go under internationals that just bolt straight under them. Um, uh, that would definitely be the way to go uh, with an international, an old international combine. Uh, now, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, machines around the country that I run into. Converted chisel plows are really good to convert uh, uh, by putting a seed box on them and putting narrow points on them. Um, and, uh, and this fact was also put press wheels behind it. Uh, he must have thought it was a good machine because he painted it John Deere Green, which I always laugh at. Uh, so, uh, but he he's sowing uh, pretty good crops. It, I mean, it doesn't. These machines, these conversions, they'll they'll sow as, as good a crop as a hundred thousand dollar machine at a fraction of the cost. This is a, a, a good machine. I like this one um, uh, from down at Best. Uh, I've forgotten now who owned it. Ben Star. And uh, that's an, a Conachet seed box is mounted on, on that, uh, on, on, on a chisel plough. So that, that would do a great job. Favourite. Uh, <laughs> I was doing it a few years ago, doing a workshop at Chinchilla in Queensland. And um, uh, this fella had photos of his machine. <laughs> <laughs> Most people carry on photos of their wife and kids. Well, this bloke had photos of his seed drill. <laughs> and it, it's an old chisel plough, and he mounted the whole combine on, on it. It, it, it. Quite ingenious. And, and he, he uh, operates it by winding that jockey wheel down between the, uh, wheel, the, the two wheels. Now, he sows over a thousand acres with this machine every year into Mitchell grass or pasture crops into Mitchell grass each year. So he, he's, uh, he's going well with it. That thing would cost, well, not, well, virtually nothing. The only problem with that machine would, would be embarrassing to own it. That's about all. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to show it to too many people. <laughs> okay, here's another one. I think Lee Stubbs is up near um, uh, Benalla somewhere. I'm not sure now. He, uh, I was doing some pasture cropping courses around there and, and he actually made his own. It's a, a very good machine. He put liquid injection on it for uh, fertilising. And um, dish drills, any type of dish drills, if you want, if you want to spend a lot of money so, uh, as well. So there's there's a, a plenty of options with this, uh, and especially people that can, can weld a bit and, and, and be a bit inventive. As many Australian farmers are. The Americans, on the other hand, don't seem to be as inventive as us Australians. Um, uh, <laughs> they seem to want new shiny stuff. The, um, uh, I think it's partly our our history. Like we were in in the, the early days of settlement. We were totally isolated from the rest of the planet, so we had to develop stuff like this. And uh, because there was it was very difficult to get anything into Australia. Um, 200 years ago, 150 years ago. Okay, sowing multi-species uh, uh, mixes. Now, this can be a bit of a problem. Um, a mix of seeds can be more difficult to sow. Now, larger seeds like pea and vetch can be sown uh, through a normal seed box as, as a mix. Like, uh, if they're similar sized seeds, they, they can be just mixed together. Now, smaller seeds like turnip, um, forage, brassica, and set, etc. If they're sown at at the same depth as those bigger seeds, 
that when they germinate and try to grow, they run out of energy before they can get their leaves to sunlight. And that's what it's related to. If you sow those small seeds too deep or any seed too deep, um, that's what happens. They don't get sunlight to get their leaves, uh, it, it don't get sunlight before they run out of energy. Um, now, the smaller seeds can be sown through a, a pasture box, which is what I, I do here. Um, I, I just um, have a pasture seed box like a, just a normal that you sow clover or loose or any, any of those parts of seeds through. I drop them down behind the machine in front of a press wheel that I have on, on my seed drill. Um, so, okay, seeds can be mixed together with disc seeders. Disc seeders don't sow very deep. Um, and so uh, if, if you're not sowing very deep, uh, you can mix them together. So it depends on just what equipment you have. Um, if you don't have an option, you, you, there, there's, I know some people that haven't got an option and we, we work out a mix that, that is, is got all big seeds in it so they can just sell it, sell it normally through a normal seed box. And that things like, um, say, in, in oats, wheat, barley, any of those, uh, pea, vetch, um, and uh, radish. Radish can be sown reasonably deep. So we can get around it to, uh, to some degree if there's no option. So um, grazing, grazing multi-species crops. Um, now, it is similar, grazing management is similar to grazing a single species crop. Um, now, uh, just got this next, next slide, I think, right. It's a bit like any grazing any crop. Um, First growth should, shouldn't start until all plant species are well established. Now, I don't find that a problem, but, but the species we use should grow at a similar rate. And most of what, the, what I'm recommending here do, there doesn't seem to be a problem with that, like having to wait for one to catch up. They, they seem to be okay with that. So they, the, the plants shouldn't be grazed until all, the, 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 all of the plants are well established and well anchored to the ground which is generally at least a foot high, 30 centimetres high. Um, now, with a grazing event, like um, uh, whether they, you, like conventional grazing, just put them on there and let them graze, but um, they, it should be grazed in stages, not just put on there and just left there. Gra graze it, and it can be over a fair period, a reasonable period of time, uh, graze it down, leave enough leaf on it um, to, so that it can recover again quite well. Um, take them off and then and then give it enough time, which is maybe three or four weeks, and then graze it again. Now, we, if we if we manage these crops well, we can get three or four grazings. Most most of you would would most likely know how to graze graze any crop anyway, so I'm probably telling you stuff you already know. Um, Use for electric fencing and strip grazing is a really good good option uh, um, and can utilise feed very well in that they don't walk around trampling all over, over feed. So that that is a very good option. Um, and always try to maintain ground cover. You don't graze it that hard that you're creating bare ground. Um, if you graze it that hard, the recovery will be too slow as well. Um, because there's no uh, there's no um, uh, cropping uh, uh, people here, this is probably not relevant to you, but I'll just go through it just, just quickly. A lot of the cropping folks, they, they terminate the crop um, uh, uh, in, uh, in order to plant a, a crop into the, the residue or the, the mulch of, of the existing crop, but they, they need to kill, kill the crop. Um, so some of them, the, the, a lot of the Americans uh, and, and people in Australia that are starting to adopt cover cropping use a herbicide to shut them down. Other people, which is a better option, uh, use use um, um, uh, a roller crimper, which which rolls the crop onto the ground and crushes the stem, which, which will kill the crop. I actually see this as a dreadful waste. Um, why not graze it? Use animals to terminate the crop. They'll mulch it down, and you'll generate some income from it. I, I um, 
the Americans, when I was over there in, in uh, 2012 or something like that, the Americans were, weren't grazing crops. They'd lost the knowledge of grazing crops. And so they were terminating crops. And I said to them, why don't you graze these things? And they hadn't thought of it. I mean, they, they, they'd they had cattle in feedlot for so long that they, they had lost the knowledge of how to graze a crop. But I was stunned by that. Um, so, okay. Um, now, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about, about pasture cropping now. Um, uh, and and, and I'll, we'll go through this and look and look at different mixes, and then I'll, we'll answer some of these questions. Um, so, multi-species. I'm just going to talk about multi-species pasture cropping now. Um, it's perennial cover cropping, and perennial grass is the cover. And we're zero tilling into a in, well, in my case, dormant uh, into a dormant sum, summer grass. Can be the other way around. Um, as well. In other words, we can grow grow a, a summer forage crop into winter species, uh, which is relevant to especially Victoria into a winter pasture. Uh, so, right, I'll oh, just uh, right. I remember, remember, this is all zero till. If we look at that. That, that photo of harvesting that crop there, and we look at and think about it through uh, what we normally do to sow a crop. Um, mostly what happens is that that, uh, that a paddock is sprayed out or ploughed you know, a few months before. With pasture cropping, what we're doing is grazing that, that crop with large, mob, or in my case, sheep, uh, only just uh, uh, a, a few days before sowing the crop, then it is zero till in, in, into that uh, zero till crop. Um, so if I'm grazing up to the point of sowing and sowing a crop, we then graze the crop uh, and, and uh, as well, and then we can still harvest a grain from that crop if we want to, and uh, then all that uh, uh, grass is still underneath the crop. So. Just this process, this is a paddock that's been, it's, there was about 30 acres here in this paddock and was grazed with about 2,000 sheep for about three days. So we mulched all that material onto the soil surface um, and then zero tilled a multi-species crop into a litter and mulch of the dormant grass. This is a multi-species crop being drilled this time. Um, now, that particular crop was oats, forage, brassica, vetch, Radish, clover, field pea, um, and turnip, and it looks the most untidy crop you could ever imagine. Um, but it's really quite interesting. Uh, all the dry-looking stuff in there is just dry, uh, dormant grass that's in its dormant phase. Um, there's another photo um, of of that, uh, just the mix amongst that grass again. Now, what happens with a mix like that is that Sheep or cattle, we seem to forget that, that sheep and cattle are ruminants. They need a lot of roughage, uh, and that's the way ruminants function. Now, what um, sheep and cattle do, they'll have a bite of that green feed that's in there, then have a bite of the dry feed and mix it. So it's a really healthy diet uh, for, for the cattle with, with, or sheep. We've never asked the animals what they actually like to eat. We give them something like a high, very high protein uh, single species crop and, and wonder why they get crook on it. There's not enough roughage in there for them. But having a mix of species plus dry material in there is actually a great advantage or, or, or very beneficial for the animals. Far better diet. There's just another crop, um, multi species. That, that's had some favourite beans and all sorts of stuff in there in that crop. Um, that's that's act, the one on 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 the on the left there again is um, uh, forage back to vetch clover, um, shiny to native grasses. That that was before it was grazed. Okay, um, just going to talk a bit about uh, how we can do this with, without herbicides. 
because I think there's quite a few people in, in your group, I think, um, that, that uh, Dean, can you uh, uh, comment on that? Are there a lot of people in here that are wanting to be organic in your group? Um, um, yes, Cole, there's, yes. <laughs> there's quite a few uh, that are organic or and probably an equal number who may not be organically certified but just want to um, follow the biological path. Right, I wanted to move that way, which is why I, I didn't, this little bit on pasture cropping, I didn't put any, any herbicide stuff in, into it. Um, but the herbicides, if we're going to use herbicides, they need to be very, very selective. Um, so without herbicides, it, it, or it's very difficult. We need to do something with, with if there's weeds growing in the paddock, um, we need to do something with them or, or manage, manage them better if we're not going to use herbicide. But certainly over time, good grazing management will increase soil surface litter and mulch. Mo most of these are the multi-species crops we sow here, I sow without a herbicide now. And that's because there's enough ground cover and very few weeds here to, to, to do it. But that wasn't the case when I first started. So in other words, uh, thick surface uh, soil surface litter will control annual weeds. Um, excess nitrate, as I mentioned earlier, uh, will also encourage uh, annual weed growth. Um, now, a, a way to, to get around this is sow the crop dry. Like if, if you're, you know there's going to be weeds in a paddock and, and you want to, want, want to do this, but, uh, and um, sow the crop dry before rain, like at, at, at the end of summer, sow it early, and, be, and before weeds germinate. Now, in doing this, what, what happens is when it does rain, uh, and this is not always possible. When it does rain, everything gets get, gets the same start off the starting blocks, and um, the uh, and what happens is that especially some of these multi-species, uh, the, the, these mixes, some of them are very fast growing. Like certain the brassicas on those are very fast growing, and they will compete fairly well with, with the weeds if they're given the same head start. A lot of that work was actually uh, developed with. Uh, Bruce Maynard and uh, Bruce and I used to do a lot of workshops together, and he developed uh, a technique called, called no kill with a K, no kill cropping, and it was a, that's a method that Bruce had always used in, in getting crops in early before anything germinated, um, uh, and then so and 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 can get some reasonable results with it. Um, okay, you're going to have weeds in the crop, but that doesn't matter too much if if your main focus is improving soil and generating stock feed. Can I just jump in, Colin, with um, given the Mount Alexander Shire region here and probably like many other regions in Australia is that, um, and people like ourselves, we were going to do this, um, sow it dry, but out of nowhere and un uncharacteristically, the rains came and beat us to that option. So here we are faced yeah. with <laughs> with the yeah. uh, weeds germinating yeah. and we still want to put a crop in we've got limited options now haven't yeah. we and that's why we want to get have this that's chat right. about a demo next week yes that. that's oh, right yeah. yes um I'll, I'll, I'll well i'll show you some photos in a minute too which is another way of addressing this as well um so um a slasher or a mulcher as in do, cutting it really short can Anything we can do to stress those weeds uh, before the, 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 the crop is sown will can be an advantage. Graze it really hard um, is, is also another thing that we definitely do. Uh, with pasture grubbing, it's always done. But gra graze everything really quite hard and, and graze those weeds as short as possible or plants that are, are going to be in there because we want to favour the crop and disadvantage the, the weeds. Um, Obviously, so a fast-growing multi-species crop, and we can sow it at, at higher uh, crop plant density as well. Is another way around it. A few of those just um, uh, things we can use to, to to try and work this, but it can be difficult. <clears throat> and we know that a, 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 a lot of weeds in a crop can definitely affect crop. There's, there's no doubt about that. <coughs> okay, I'm going to talk a bit about. Now about another way of doing this, um, and um, this is reasonably uh, cost-effective. Um, um, 
I haven't got the slides of the um, soil key. The soil key is a way of, get, of doing it too, uh, uh, which is a machine being developed, and, um, but a very expensive machine. Now, Jason Hagen, I think he's down the road from you fellas there somewhere, I think. Some of you might be know, know Jason there. Uh, he's an organic producer. <coughs> and this is a yeoman's plough that he's got, and he put a seed box on it and, and also a, a, a double disc zero till uh, 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 attachment on, on right across the back. Now, I've got a couple of different options here. Now, these photos here, I don't know, can you see that mouse? I'm, I'm, is that show up on your, your maybe you, you can't. Now, when we run that machine, now this, we're not, we're not ripping really deep. We're not like a normal, with a normal, um, say, key line ploughing. Or we're only only ripping just deep enough to get under the roots of, of the plant um, to create a kill zone. Um, remember, these uh, yeoman's type ploughs are there's two feet between them, and they will create a kill zone about eight inches wide, which you can see in that top left hand photo. Um, now that gives an opportunity to to actually get some seed in there in in that drill road, which is. Totally organic. It's just a mechanical kill method, and the it, it's important to have good uh, uh, width between the rows, and that being two feet works well. Now you saw on those crops in those other photos, they've come up well. Okay, he's got some weeds. Eventually came up in, in that bottom right hand and photo, but um, uh, that he produced certainly a, a, a lot of feed off that paddock. So that's. Now, this fellow uh, did some work with over near Orange, Central Tablelands here, Don Murray, and he developed his own machine and it's slightly different. And this is a good machine he's, he's developed. I think he made the whole unit from, from the ground up. But again, put yeoman's type um, shanks on it. Uh, he's put three three seed box on here. I think he yeah he's adding a bit of fertiliser here. Um, <coughs> and a small seed box and a, norm, a bigger box. And the same same thing really, um, and so he's getting some pretty good results. So he's getting a renovation effect, but also being able to sow sow some of these species um, into into um, his paddocks without a herbicide and without turning soil upside down, but getting enough enough kill on them on on, on with with that unit to be able to get plants established enough. It, it's certainly a good way. It works very similar similar to the soil key, in that um, you keep creating a kill zone. So, so um, just some some good options uh, for people there, which is it doesn't necessarily have to be overly expensive. Um, need to be a bit inventive if you want to do all that yourself. But um, so, and. Um, Jason Hagen, I guess, uh, which is near you, you fellas, it'd probably be worth contacting him and uh, and seeing how he's going with it, um, with his organic property there. Now, is it possible to harvest grain for a multi-species crop? You know, you'd think no, but but yes, it is. And there's a couple of different ways of, of, of going about this. Um, now I've got this as pasture cropping, but it, but it can be could be done not necessarily with pasture cropping as well. But so now the way I've done this this uh, here is um, because you've got a mix of species, um, oats something like oats or the cereals will recover from three three grazings or probably more. However. Most of the plants like bra brassica, pea, and, and all, pretty well all those we've got in that mix won't recover. They'll, they'll two grazings, maybe three at the very most, you will remove them. They won't recover after, after three grazings. Um, but the oats will, providing, providing the, at the stock are removed when that, the, the, the cereal in there, the oats or wheat, are starting to form grain in, in the stem, which is called booting. Um, now that we, we can de definitely do that, I, I do that most years here with these multi species crops. Remove the plants you don't want with animals and then let the cereal recover. 
uh, I'd hear some photos of it, um, uh, like just a sequence there. Uh, same same paddock, uh, just after three grazings on the top right hand corner, you can see all all of the the broadleaf um, species, brassicas and peas, and all those have been removed, and the oats is now recovering. Um, and then we can harvest a, a, a grain crop from that. Um, it's just a, it, it's certainly possible. I mean, we do that all the time anyway with, with say, an oat crop, uh, of, of removing animals out in time uh, and, and then harvesting grain. But we can still do that with a multi-species as well. In regard to pasture cropping, we've still got a grassland intact after the harvest as well. It's that bottom right-hand corner. I know. There's another way of doing this. So I was wondering whether we could also harvest a multi-species mix of grain. Now, this particular crop, um, oats, vetch, radish, pea, turnip, clover, all that, oh, the clover become irrelevant at that stage, but uh, the forage, but they're all so on, so on uh, together there, yeah, just a normal, normal mix. This time, I didn't graze it deliberately, didn't graze it very hard. Um, and, and just let them all recover at the same time. And I didn't know whether you could, could harvest a multi-species uh, crop. Um, but we tried this and it was fairly untidy looking. And my I've got a neighbor that lives down the road, I get him to contract harvest and he thinks I'm a total rat bag. <laughs> um, this was really quite interesting. It, he had a, a fairly modern header harvester and uh, it did a pretty good job on it. I was at that, um, and I cleaned this seed, and there, we had, had to cut the wind right back on, on, on the, the header, um, but I got a mix, and I, I cleaned the, I separated the big seed from the little seed deliberately just to see what was in it, and, um, uh, and it was a pretty good mix. And I, I, all I did with that was I just used it to re-sow it. There's, there's certainly not a market for that, other than it would make very good pig feed or chook feed, but um, I, I just re it as a mix. So it is possible to harvest a multi-species mix. Um, and in regard to here, we, we then have, have um, uh, uh, a grass stand left with pasture cropping. Okay, um, now, this is a, I've just got a, a mix of, of, of species here, uh, just just to, to demonstrate that like with rates and things. I, I can send all the, these mixes to Dean, uh, different different mixes. Um, now, that's, which can be sent out to you. This is a, a pretty well the mix I mentioned before, like uh, of, a, of a good animal performance. Um, the oats can be less than that um, in there, the field pea, vetch, forage, brassica, turnip, sweet, all those. That works well for really good stock feed. Now, here's one for, for fixing hard compacted soils. Um, and and um, uh, also laying a bit more uh, ground cover. So, like uh, uh, creating creating good good uh, surface litter, and, and in this I uh, we've, we've uh, it, it put a lot of cereal rye in that mix. Um, you could you could even cut the oats out if you wanted to and, and uh, increase that cereal rye. Hillage radish is really quite high, um, and we've got turnip in there as well and some pea and vetch. Like you wouldn't just simply put tinnies tinnies radish on its own. Uh, you'd need these others in there as well. Um, organic matter, again, most uh, really concentrating on, on cereal rye and cutting back on a lot of these others, like on the, on the brassicas, so that that cereal rye doesn't break down quite as quickly. And so you're re retaining good ground cover. Um, in regard to improving the soil biology, uh, this one works, works well and uh, 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 as well, like, um, I, I, a lot more leafy type plants in there as well. Okay, um, 
we're just about finished here now, the, the talk here now, but we really should, in summing a lot of this stuff up, our farms really should, should function as ecosystems. And these, these um, um, mixes can be a stepping stone or a transition to getting our farms working well for us. Uh, they're not the total answer. We, we, we need to make sure we start to move it towards perennial pastures um, or diverse, diverse pastures is a better way to describe that. Um, and there's a good reason for that. Our grasslands all, all around Australia and the ones in Victoria were magnificent grasslands. They had 300 species in them. So we need our pastures to function more like grasslands. If we're sowing pastures, we need more species in them. And that's why these are part of the reason why these multi-species mixes work well as well also. So how do we restore our farms? We really need to have a good look at how we graze our animals. Um, uh, and that's primarily done with a, a good grazing rotation and, and good plant recovery. Um, grow crops without killing existing grasslands, and that, that's really pasture cropping, or, and grow multi-species crops, or we can do all of the above. Um, now, there was a question that came up there a while ago. Um, I just I noticed, oh, I will address it now. The fastest way I've, I've seen and, 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 and we've, I've experienced is of fixing a property is sowing these multi a, a, a good really good multi species mix on, on a property that's old cropping country or really bare or just dysfunctional pasture which I've got a question on this there a while ago um, so a winter spot multi species mix follow that with a summer multi species mix now in the next uh, the next presentation I do I will put a bit on summer multi species mixes. Uh, just just quickly, um, and those summer multi-species mixes can be based on millet, um, cow peas, even lab lab. Um, there, there's uh, uh, like sunflowers. Um, uh, there's a lot of different things we can use in the summer as well. But what, where I'm getting at here, so I, I, I went as multi-species mix, then layer it with a, a summer mix, come back and then do a winter mix again, then another summer mix, and you will fix that paddock. Those mixes work really well and they're really good grazing. So in other words, use them for grazing. Uh, uh, and remember, you, you're really trying to fix the soil, but, but layering one crop on top of another like that will drive it really, really, really quite quickly. And it's the fastest way of fixing, fixing degraded country and degraded properties. So we can address uh, some of these questions now. We probably, hopefully we might have a few more. Okay, Tulip. That tulip is one problem weed here. It's toxic to stock even did they? Wow. I don't know anything about cat tulip. Um, hang on. So that was Sue's question, Sue. Yeah, but I'll just I'll just speak. It's probably quicker than typing. <laughs> but yes, it is a, it is a perennial. Yeah. Okay. So perennials are are more of a problem. I uh, they they they're difficult to fix. Uh, and and uh, you know, ground cover and, and that uh, is a lot of some some of the perennials are, are colonizing species. Anything that's a colonizer can be fixed or, or controlled at least with with good ground cover and a lot of these methods we're talking about. And and, uh, and the reason it's there, I mean, um, so yeah, that one's a difficult one, and we need to take that a bit more seriously. Uh, that those perennial most perennial weeds are, are, are more serious. So, um, and also there's one above that. Um, is there a, a way to control perennial weeds like tech, like, like needle grass with cover cropping without herbicide? Again, very difficult. Uh, needle grass is, uh, is needle grass a summer, a summer grower or, or not? Uh, I think it is, isn't it? Is it or not? Um, is it grow through the summer? If it's a summer grower, you can actually sell crop. Yeah. Um, again, the same same thing. I try to maintain as much ground cover as you possibly can. Uh, um, yeah. I again take them very seriously. Those those perennial weeds, especially especially without herbicide, uh, can be can be difficult. 
what we need on them are actually biological controls. Well, and some people have the view that um, these weeds like Texan or Chilean needlegrass will, with um, effective grazing management and pasture restoration, they'll just work their way out of the system over time. That's certainly Tom's view. Yeah, that is definitely good grazing management, as in graze them uh, really, really hard, uh, and then very long plant recovery uh, is, I reckon, the best way to manage them. Um, but maintaining very good ground cover is, is definitely the better way to do that. Um, so absolutely, especially any situation, any, any um, management that ha that creates bare ground is really opening up your farm for those types of invasive uh, invasive weeds. So maintain full ground cover all the time is, is the key to that, and that's definitely related to good grazing management. I normally I normally talk a bit about grazing management in these in these talks. Uh, didn't in this one. But that doesn't mean to say it's not important, it's vitally important to get grazing really good. Um, uh, growing into phalaris, phalaris is, is difficult. It's such an aggressive uh, perennial. The, and an option for phalaris is to, uh, and, and uh, so, some of those winter perennials, is to think about reversing it around and sowing a, a summer growing multi-species crop into it um, when it's not as growing as actively is, is, is the better way. And not only that, if you've got a good phalaris paddock, you probably don't need to be putting a multi-species crop into that one. It's good. There's probably enough food in it. Select a paddock that doesn't have as, as much uh, phalaris or uh, winter growing perennials is another way around that. What are, this is from Jess, what are C4 summer options for dryland farming in mid northern Victoria after the annual winter crop is finished? There are no living roots in the soil. Okay. Yep. Right. That's a great question and very, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. Um, what I don't understand is the advice we get on, on sowing, sowing pastures and the work that's been done by our departments have never looked at summer uh, pasture species. You know, uh, here I'm talking about not, not native species, but things like digit grass, uh, even green panic, some of those, those they, and they're C4s or, or warm season grass, uh, grass that grow through the summer. We should be including some of those in, 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 our, in our pasture mixes, especially if there aren't uh, any, any native uh, species that left there. So, or, and Victoria, what a lot of people don't realise, Victoria was dominated by warm season summer grassland originally, and, and the early explorers reports verify that. Um, so it is important to get, get uh, so, something happening over the summer. Um, so that's, that's just to answer that, I mean, obviously very, very quickly. Um, Ah, please explain the different pros and cons of starting with winter multi-species cover crops at, or, or summer. Um, I think we've probably addressed that with uh, well, a couple of things. Um, you can go either way. The, the, the main disadvantage with it, with a summer uh, a summer crop is uh, having enough rainfall. It is riskier in in the summer because you get a lot more evaporation. So you, you, with a summer multi-species mix, <coughs> you, um, it can be a bit risky, so you need to keep your costs as low as possible um, because you, you, you can get a, a lot of just dry weather anywhere in Australia. You can get a lot of, lot of dry weather and, and get a failed crop. So keep the, 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 the uh, costs as low as possible. Um, but as I mentioned before, it can be a good way to drive it by having a, a, a winter mix in the summer and then follow it by a summer summer mix. Um, and stock only grows one, two, okay. What if stock only grows one or two species of the cover crop? Should you move them on or try to get them to graze the remaining species? Now, usually, uh, now, this, this, this can happen sometimes. Um, Sometimes it takes them a while to work out what a plant is, 
And if they if they've never seen it, they actually don't. It's not that they don't like it; they've never tasted it before. Um, and interesting, uh, animals learn from their mothers what to eat. So if mum's never eaten a brassica or a pea or whatever, um, there's a fair chance she won't teach the young what to eat. So that's that's what ha happens there. Um, so you don't you actually don't want to be them to leave them there to 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 log out everything else and leave them. So you 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 would um, you'd move them before they grazed grazed the, the more and a more palatable ones down. Um, however, I actually haven't found much of a problem with that. Uh, they 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 soon learn to eat it. So it mightn't be as much of a problem as, as you think. Um, another one here, uh, transitioning uh, from Graham. Uh, I had to disc and smudge my paddock first as it was so rough and, and, and potholy after, after rocks were removed. I didn't, I didn't do it lightly, but I had to make it level. Okay, can move forward easily, did I do the wrong thing? No, I don't think so. Sometimes I don't think you did the wrong thing. I, if you've got a real problem paddock, I, people ask me this question all the time, or a really serious problem perennial weed, um, and so what do you do? Do, you, do you, 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 you follow things exactly as you should, or or do you get in and, and just <laughs> annihilate that weed and then move on? Uh, for example, I know I'm off track here a little bit, but sometimes you can fight a, a, a really problem weed for 50 years and still not be able to solve it. So sometimes the hard, the hard approach can be better and then move on from there, which is where I'm getting at with this. If it was... If the paddock was just um, in, in bad condition to start with, levelling it can be an option, and then move on move on from that point. Uh, so I, I think that that's fine, um, but you shouldn't need to go back to to, uh, to disking it. I, I I would think um, that's good. You've got Grant Sims's uh, contact details in here, Dean. That's good. Um, There's a few new okay. comments. Oh. Yep. A few new ones down the bottom, is there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just about to answer that. Check. There was one up the top here, inoculate legumes before sowing. Uh, and the one up here was uh, also, where, where is it? Uh, understand that lucerne needs to be inoculated with a specific fungi to germinate. It's not actually a fungi, um, um, but, but uh, it's actually a bacteria. That inoculation is, and it, it'll germinate without that, but it is good to inoculate uh, legumes be, before sowing, um, and uh, it's not, not a problem with that. It's it's a natural occurring bacteria that that helps the, the legume form nodules, um, which will then then it will start producing nitrogen. So yes, uh, it, it's uh, uh, a good thing to do. Can you please answer my one or two cycles of cover crops? Is that one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, winter and summer, two weeks before perennial. Can you please answer my one or two cycles? My, uh, where is that question at? It was earlier on, but I think it relates to whether you put a winter in followed by summer, then another winter, and then that's the cycle before you sow it down to pastures. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, it's what we were talking about before. The um, yes, it, it's just a, a, a method that I've been advising people to do if they want to fix that paddock quickly, um, and, and it, it, it does work well. So, at least at least one summer and one 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 winter and one summer, um, and then have a look at it then and see how your paddock's going, and then maybe go again. Uh, um, but you will we'll find that the soil structure will fit will will improve first uh, if, when you start doing this. I'm not sure that answers the question or not. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I'd say yeah, winter or summer, two of each before perennial, or just one. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I would evaluate the paddock after, after one or two. You yeah, certainly are, certainly more than one. And um, Jeff has a question. Do you, 
uh, yeah, one down the bottom. Do you commonly use Gramoxone before sowing a multi-species crop? What, what about its toxicity? Okay, Gramoxone, um, I'll just I'll tell the, 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 the story. Uh, Roundup was was uh, was not really suitable because it kills everything. So I, I started, look, this is many years ago, <clears throat> 25 years ago. I started using another, looking for another herbicide and Gramoxone came up as, as a, a herbicide that doesn't kill perennials. Um, but and, and it's it's good in that transition uh, phase, but I've never ever liked using it. No one likes using it, gramoxone or spray seed. <clears throat> um, it's it's kind of perennial plants and it doesn't kill them and it will will kill um, uh, annuals, but it's a horrible thing to use. I have I had been looking for something else, and there's a herbicide called Basta, B A S T A, which works as a desiccant, a very similar to gramoxone, but <laughs> is a lot more user friendly. Um, it, it's it's a better herbicide to use than Gramoxone. <clears throat> so BASTA is, is is that herbicide. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I've been experimenting with it and, and uh, just to see what rates, getting the rates down to a, to a reasonable level and as low as possible, so that it controls weeds but doesn't kill perennial plants. Um, and that rate that I found was 1.2 to 1.5 litres per hectare with 100 litres of water per hectare. Um, okay, we seem to have run out of questions. I have, I have another question, um, Cole, about use, the use of biological stimulants at the time of sowing or you know, if you see foliar sprays, if you've got products like Nutrisoil, for example, or compost teas and so on? Yeah, uh, Nutrisoil is a very good product. Um, it's uh, like, which is a worm leachate. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I, I think it's good. I, I've used it here uh, I'm not over the years. But <clears throat> the best example of, of, of uh, good biological um, are the Haggerty's in Enoday and Haggerty in Western Australia, and they use worm leachate and, and, and compost extract together. Um, they're getting amazing results with it. Um, so it's just something to to think about there uh, on those very poor West Australian soils, not using fertiliser but using both the worm leachate, which is Nutrisoil, um, and uh, and compost extract. No. All right, Cole. Well, thanks for a terrific session. Uh, thanks for your time, generosity, and... Very good. Thank you. And thanks, Darren, and thanks for people attending. Thank you.